Yo, what's going on, fam, out there? And we are back for another week of the Cannabis Diversity Report. This week, it is a true pleasure to have my good friend, Gia Marone, the president of Women Grow and um, GVM Communications, somebody who's doing so many great things for the industry, not only for women, but for people of color. Gia, it's so good to have you here. How have you been? I'm great to hear. It is so good to be on your show and to be with you um, this morning. It's good to see you. Absolutely. And I, I know you're up there in New York. How's everything going up there? What's the weather like? Y'all got a lot of snow? You know, actually, I was so surprised today. It's finally like kind of feeling like a nice day. It's 40 degrees. So like, oh, it feels like spring. Uh, but we just had snow like the day before yesterday. And I just saw more is coming. But more importantly, um, we're in our new legislative session. So maybe that's why it's snowing so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and speaking of that with New York, man, there's so there's so much to talk about, and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing um hearing from you about that. Um and so you know for for everybody out there listening that that doesn't know about you, could you talk a little bit about you know what you do um you know with women grow and, and GVM and how you got into the cannabis industry? Sure. So I'll actually start the reverse because GVM Communications, um, which is my firm, which is PR, um, brand strategy and business development, um, was actually started on April 20th, 2012. No idea I was going to be in the cannabis industry and no idea this. Well, I'm not going to say I didn't know the significance of 420, but I didn't think that I would end up in the cannabis industry having starting a company on 420 2012. So I thought, wow, you know, the writing was on the wall without me even recognizing it. Um, so I um, started GBM Communications after leaving um, Wall Street, um, where I worked for 15 years there, and um, wanted to continue doing the work I'd always been doing. So collectively, I've been doing um, this type of PR work for about 30 years. And um, I just said, you know what, let's keep going, but I want to do it as an entrepreneur. I want to serve um, not only small businesses, but unique businesses that uh, really could uh, use this type of service. And the more and more that I started looking into the industries across the board, that's when I started learning about the cannabis industry. And, you know, again, having had the prior um, experience on Wall Street, knowing to pay attention to forecasts and, you know, seeing the coverage, I thought this is something that I may want to take a serious look at. And of course, in exploring it, you know, not seeing any reflections of myself, you, you said it, I'm from New York. I'm not just from New York State. I'm from New York City. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I rep Brooklyn every time. And so having grown up in Brooklyn and recognizing what, um, you know, marijuana, um, how it impacted my very own communities, I thought, well, instead of turning a blind eye or ignoring what I see is emerging, I wanted to uh, emerge myself into what I saw was coming up. And so, you know, I just started educating myself about this industry. And, you know, like everyone else, I thought I needed to grow or own a retail place uh, and recognizing that um, that wasn't the case. And it was through my research that I actually came across Women Grow. And um, I saw um, an interview uh, that the founder was doing, Jane West, and um, started learning more about her and Jasmine Hump, learned that there was a women grow market here in New York City, found my way to um, one of the meetings. And, you know, after going for a while, which the first meeting I went to, um, you know, I was I was share the story that, you know, there were only five black people at the first meeting that I went to for women grow. But what was interesting about it was the location of the meeting was just a stone throw away from Wall Street. And I thought, how is this happening in New York City? And no one knows about it, right? Like it just wasn't as popular. And so, you know, I met those five Black people at the meeting, um, still in touch with, with the 
definitely. So as a matter of fact, I think, you know, Tanya Osborne, I met Tanya Osborne at that very first meeting, but um, you know, the others I met still in touch. And, you know, I just thought, this is interesting. I'm going to start telling more people about this. And so I did, I started inviting more people to it. And, um, and then after going um, to women grow for a while, after reaching out, you know, started volunteering at their events, like, how can I help started doing PR for the, um, for the New York city market. And then um, had connected with the headquarters and was asked to, you know, work with the headquarters. I actually took them on as a client. So they were, you know, my client under GVM, although I work closely with them. And then the relationship just started building from there. And um, yeah. And so as things progressed, eventually, you know, taking the role on investing into the company. And so, you know, many people know Dr. Shonda Macias, she's chairwoman and CEO, and I'm the president um, of the company. We both invested in, we're partners in the business. And it's been incredible. You know, it's been an interesting ride learning about the industry uh, from the ancillary side of the business. Uh, But, you know, GVM communication still continues to operate. I'm super proud of the work that uh, myself and my team are doing. You know, we serve a number of um, the clients of the big businesses within the industry, which is awesome. So, you know, we're understanding and and I like to say we continue to be students of the industry. Yeah, and definitely, you know, I I think Women Grow is definitely one of the most important um, organizations in the industry. And so much love for our girl, Dr. Shonda, you know, especially as a Howard Bison. She was one of the people that was instrumental for me, like getting into the industry. Never forget the first time I met her. It was at a Women's Grow event in D.C. And never met her from a can of paint. And her and Michael, like I told him I was from Howard and what I wanted to do. She put me to work right there. And we've been connected, um, you know, ever since. Um, And like you said, it started out something small. Like, you know, there and now you've grown up to be such a like such a big organization. How, how many chapters and how many members does Women Grow have now? So I'm going to talk pre pandemic because, um, you know, unfortunately, once the pandemic hit, we had to really close a lot of the operations that we had across the country. We were actually in the middle of making a big change, right? And rolling out a new program. Uh, And so we had um, a number of of markets across the country and then the pandemic hit and then we had to like shut it all down. Uh, But, you know, I I, I look at that as well, we are saddened that we can no longer have our in-person events that you're familiar with, right? That where you met Dr. Shonda, which, you know, when you look at a number of the leading women in the industry, many of them started at a women girl meeting, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, our mission has, has always been from the onset to connect, to educate, empower, and inspire the next generation of leaders. So when you look at many of these women leaders in the industry, they met at a women grow meeting. They're, the idea of the company came out of a women grow meeting. Um, their partners, they met at a meeting. Uh, their service providers, employees. And so that's always been, you know, what, I don't want to say it's the secret sauce, but that's always been the draw, right? To our women grow signature networking events. Um, and then the pandemic hits, right? And then we can no longer like, congregate together, not only in these markets across the country, but also at our annual leadership summit, which everyone looks forward to, right? These are women coming not only from across the country, we'd have women come from as far as Australia and and different parts of Europe and the Caribbean coming in for what was considered the largest women's conference in the cannabis industry. Uh, And so once the pandemic hit, we thought, well, how do we continue to connect with our community? And um, so we took everything to social media. Yeah. That's where everyone was, right? Like, so why create something new? Why not meet the people where they are, which is kind of what we've always done. And so um, we hope that as we continue to go through 2021, we can then begin to share more announcements about um, our new programming that will be coming out of um, of, of, uh, of our company. Right, I mean, and speaking of programming and, and making that pivot to virtual events, we just had a, 
an amazing um, virtual event this past weekend. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. And and so again, thank you for asking because that is part of um, you know one of the programs that we hope to continue. So in 2019, we actually partnered with Emmanuel Baptist Church, um, which is the first church in the country to actually host. Uh, um, the Business of Cannabis Summit. This is the name we came up with. And this is the first church in the country that actually hosted this type of um, topic, right, in their, their, uh, their facility. And the church opened their entire building to us. So in 2019, we had over 60 speakers from across the country. Uh, we had a full day conference. And when I say we took over the building, we were in the actual sanctuary itself. We took over three floors of the building. We were in the school building, having one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, and it was an amazing event, amazing, amazing. And so we thought we would have the same thing in 2020. And again, affected by the pandemic. Well, what was amazing is that the pastor, um, which I then, actually joined the church. After that, how could you not join a church, right? Like that? I'm like, I got to join because they're so supportive of the work. But, you know, it's always been a progressive church and um, has always stood behind social justice. And so the pastor said, well, you know, we have to do this again, but let's do it virtually. And so this past weekend um, on February 19th and 20th, we had uh, an even bigger event uh, where we had um, a focus on social justice and social equity on February 19th. And then we focused all on the business aspect of the industry on February 20th. And these were like incredible sessions that were live streamed and hopefully the replay will be up soon. Uh, and we hope to continue um, the workshops following as we did in 2019. So when, after the summit, that we had in 2019, we had six consecutive workshops. And so we're hoping to do the same thing again, um, because it's so important that we bring this access of education and information to the community. Right. And I think that's such an important event, especially because the church is such a cornerstone in the black community. And I think that events like that can go such a long way about not only breaking the stigma um, but also just educating people on business opportunities. I think about somebody like my own grandmother, you know, churches, I mean, except for you know, now because she can't go, but that's the only place she goes. That's her old, her entire social life. So, you know, what was the experience like, you know, doing that with the church, um, you know, and, and, you know, what's your opinion on it? You know, what's interesting to hear. So I, I'll tell you, I, I love telling this story. So the, the whole concept really came out of a shared Uber ride with the pastor. Wow. And what's interesting is that we were both coming from um, the DMV area. He was coming from one event. We had no idea we were on the same Amtrak. And it's midnight. I'm coming from DC after um, having meetings and, and doing some lobbying down there. And I'm coming back to New York. And it's about midnight, you know, we come off the escalator and I see him and I'm like, hey, how are you? I've known the pastor for quite some time. Our kids went to school together. So, you know, long time, um, you know, neighbors and friends, you know, within the community. But so he asked me, are you going back to Brooklyn? I said, yes. He said, well, let's share an Uber. Okay. The thought that occurred to me is he's going to ask me what's up. And he doesn't know that I'm in this industry. And do I tell him or do I just fake it? Like he knows that I, you know, he knew my prior work being, you know, on, on in the corporate space and on Wall Street. And so, of course, just like clockwork, we get in the car. He's like, hey, what's up? What's happening with you? And I did a quick prayer like, God, I I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to say. And I said, well, Rev, I'm in the cannabis industry. And I'm coming from meetings in Washington, D.C. And without judgment, he says, really, I've been reading about that. And, and, and tell me more, what are you doing? And what typically would take, um, you know, a 25-minute ride from Penn Station to Brooklyn, 
I don't know. It just so happened that there was traffic at midnight. We're stuck in traffic. And so it, it took almost an hour to get back. And by the time, um, you know, I was the first drop off, he and the Uber driver didn't want me to get out because yeah, they were like, was. we learned more about this industry in this car ride than we ever knew. Like he had no idea, you know, of the finance aspect of it. He had no idea that technology plays a role within our industry. He had no idea of the, the various um, um, ancillary opportunities, you know? And so while he was reading about it, he also didn't know that black people were in it. Right. And so the fact of, you know, not only he learned about women grow and what we were doing and he thought, this is fascinating. Do people know about this? And so, you know, he wished me luck and I went off about my way. And this is 2018. A couple of months later, I'm invited to the church and he says, hey, we're having this Saturday event. I'd love for you to come and talk about the work you do in the cannabis industry. And I thought, OK, talking to him was fine. Like, what are the people going to say? And so I did something that I thought would help people understand I gathered every product I had in my house. I gathered every book, every magazine that included either a black person on the cover or had profiles of black people in the industry. Because I said, if I was going to the black church, I've got to make sure that I am, I am speaking to them in a way that is relatable. It's not just my voice. I also have to highlight people like yourself who are operating in this space. And then I took all the topicals, the CBD topicals I had, the creams I showed. I didn't bring any weed into the church, just in case anyone was wondering. And it went over so well that the first session, um, I had mostly seniors. All they wanted to know is if I had cream for their arthritis. And then the second session, not only did the seniors come back, some of them even brought their grandchildren back because they wanted them to understand what the business opportunities were. And I didn't realize that the show and tell was going to be such a big hit. And that led to the summit. That summit has now just turned into what it is today. So to answer your question, I think that when we're able to communicate and address people's concerns in a way that disarms their defense, we're then able to better connect and, and communicate, right? Because now they're no longer, they're not, they're no longer defensively listening, right? Mm -hmm. They're now open to hearing something new. And that's why I think the business of um, Cannabis Summit has been successful the first, you know, two times we've done it because we're addressing whatever concerns people may have. Right. And that's such an amazing story. Like you said, just doing it and meeting people where they are and actually showing them, right? They, if it's not the same when you read about something as when you see it firsthand and you're like, oh, it's not just smoking weed. We're talking about you're fixing my arthritis, all these other things. So that is it's a game changer. Well, the other important thing to hear that um, I learned, some of the people were coming to the meetings and saying, hey, my family has land down south. My family has land in the Caribbean. What can we do about this? And right. so, you know, even when we had our Business of Cannabis Summit over the weekend, one of the areas we talked about was land use and cannabis real estate. Mm -hmm. and understanding what that means. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can all begin to talk about that more, right? Because oftentimes, you know how challenging it is for many people to find real estate, right? For their businesses, especially based on zoning. Um, not, you know, not everyone has to purchase the land. They could perhaps lease it and being able to create those business opportunities. And so I think some of the folks were thinking about this, not necessarily entering, but figuring out how can I help my family's legacy continue to live on? And so understanding that someone may have, you know, I met someone had 75 acres, right? In South Carolina, this is like a few years ago, or they, they were approached by um, companies who wanted their soil. And I thought, yeah, these are all the things that are needed for our industry. And that 
to me, is what helps people to understand um, what we're doing to build this industry versus just only seeing the consumption side of it. Right. And that's such a good point, too, because especially like that point that you just made about down south, especially in our like in the black community, there's so many people that have the land down south. Like I think about my family, same situation, South Carolina. And then we just saw Mississippi legalized. And it's only a matter of time before we see some of these other states coming online. So it's going to be important for us to be prepared and educated about that. Um, and allowing, you know, even creating a space for black farmers to operate right and 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 for many that i found at the church who said hey listen you know my family's been you know farming for years like can they grow hemp can they go and it's not as easy as can you just start growing but at least they begin to learn and understand and you know given the i would say the historical um issues that lie with black farmers losing their land, right? And, or their land being taken away from them or just not unfortunately facing um, a serious financial um, crisis. Hopefully this is an entry point where this could build, right? That, that um, uh, revenue for them to, to get back on top. But you know, at least the information is there versus not having the access to it at all. Right. And, and speaking of educating people on access to opportunities in the industry, one thing you said earlier that I think makes so much sense is that people understand that it's not just plant touching opportunities. But I think you're a great example, right? Like working on Wall Street, doing communications, a highly regulated industry. When you look at cannabis, those scales directly correlate. So I'm always trying to educate people on how they can do what they're already doing today, um, you know, in this industry and, and really be able to come in because it's so new that if you are somebody who excels outside, you can kill it here. So, I mean, talk about, you know, your experience transit, you know, transition. Can you hear me now? Yep, I hear you. There you go. So what I didn't know to hear was that um, I didn't know that my experience on Wall Street would even be needed or necessary here. I had no idea that whatever I had been doing the years before was actually preparing me for what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is even upon entry into this industry, while I saw cannabis as a commodity at some point, right? I didn't think about, oh my God, these companies are going public. Oh my goodness. And, and, and I understand, you know, I, I, having worked in media relations, you know, at my um, former employer that, wow. Okay. So here I am. They're talking about M&A transactions. I understand how to communicate that in press releases and how to talk to media about that. And, you know, really look at what, you know, companies are talking about in terms of deal structure and so it's interesting to say, wow, it really does apply here. And so for anyone else that is in the technology space, I mean, you think about how much technology is a part of our industry and how much those skill sets can be applied here. Um, it's incredible to me. And, and being able to have that experience and apply it, you know, and, and um, I would say it's an attraction for clients who are coming to GVM communications, having known these people have these various backgrounds. So they understand the work that we're doing and we're able to help them tell their story. Right. And so, or able to help them navigate in terms of even just business development and building and, and branding. So it's been, you know, I'd say an incredible um, experience for us. I'd have to say 2020 was probably one of our best years ever. Mm -hmm. While we were faced with crisis, um, you know, across the, the, the world, one of the areas that my company focuses on is crisis management. And so we were able to handle a lot of crisis communications for companies where, you know, generally during a down market, our services and, and those like ours are usually the first to go. Whereas companies are like, no, we need you. We need your services to help guide us through 
um, you know, this period, whether if it's, you know, communicating how we'll operate, you know, during COVID or how we transition into operating from pickup and delivery service to just, you know, announcing in a way that um, doesn't feel too braggadocious while there's so many people who are without jobs or, you know, or, or, or businesses shutting down. And so, you know, I'm really proud of the work that our incredible team has done, you know, on GVM communications for our clients and so proud of the work that our clients did last year. Um, And, you know, are excited about this year as well. Yeah. And, you know, that that has to be, I mean, I imagine you've had some interesting conversations because in 2020, there was so much work to be done in crisis communications, whether it was, like you said, just people talking about COVID, but even I'll say socially, like with everything, the uprisings that we're having, and and it was important for companies to have proper communication around all those things. To hear, I, I've ne- no one's ever asked me that question, and I'm so happy you have. So here's the interesting part. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this PR work, as I said, for almost 30 years now. Um, and I didn't think that, again, the work that I did on Wall Street would apply here. So one of the areas that I covered while working, um, so I was at Goldman Sachs for 15 years, and then prior to that, I was in corporate um, entertainment. Uh, for six years. So, um, but while on Wall Street, I actually covered diversity and inclusion, especially in terms of media. And of course, addressing, you know, making sure to be a part of that um, narrative as we're communicating any sort of news cycle around that. And so when you think about what happened last year, um, and again, upon entering the industry, diversity and inclusion has I feel like has always been a part of the conversation. Why? I think because many of the advocates and early um, settlers in the industry who look like us said, hey, we're going to hold the, account- the industry accountable, making sure that we- it is inclusive. But then you've got, um, you know, George Floyd. Then you've got uh, uh, um, Breonna Taylor. Then you've got, so you had all of these, these, these incidents happen Um, murderous incidents happen. And the industry itself, there was, there was a light that was, that was shining on, on us. And what I appreciated is that I have an incredible team that has a similar background and experience to myself, that we were able to walk our clients through in a way that allowed them to think through before reacting. Mm-hmm. And that's so important because we spoke from experience, right? This wasn't just about the business. This was, I'm a black woman. Before anything else, I'm a black woman. So if anyone else can talk about this experience, I can. But now I'm also a professional black woman who's also worked in the corporate space. So I can also give you that perspective as well. But now I'm a black professional woman in the cannabis industry. So let me give you that other perspective. And so as you're trying to communicate and articulate your messaging on why you support certain uh, organizations or why it's so important that you incorporate supporting communities of color moving forward and not just during, you know, uh, an uprise, but it's part of your business practice. And, And honestly, we told our clients, if this is just for show, we're not the company for you. And so I love and appreciate our clients because they took this so seriously. And we, all, we actually had other people come to us to say, we heard about the work that you're doing and you were highly recommended to us because it's not just the conscious work that you're doing, but also the business work because you continuously hold the clients accountable to say, does this align with your business practice? How will this look to the public? And so, you know, I think, you know, the work that we're doing not only is important, but it's how our clients are receiving it and, and their people that they're serving is just as important as well. Right. And like you said, that perspective and experience is so valuable. And, and all of us have so much to thank Black women for the way y'all have been holding holding this movement and community. And everything. It's important to have diverse. I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's so important to, ha- to 
to tap into service providers that are diverse. Because if you have the same voices at the table, advising about things that they may not have the expertise in, then how are they really giving you a different perspective? Yeah, so true. And, and I mean, even to that point, like when you talk about women, and I know you do so much work there, um, like you said, that value of diversity and having women, having people of color in the C-suite and decision-making chairs is so impactful. NCI actually just did a study um, about um, about a women's diversity study. Gender. Mm-hmm. It, it, the, the gender parity study. You know, I, I, as a woman leading in the industry, I'd love to get your take on, you know, where you, you know, where you feel like women are in the industry and where, where some steps need to be made, where we can change and, and kind of help. So, you know, what's interesting. Cannabis, of course, is the first industry to lead in terms of um, women executives, right? That's, that's what we've seen. That's the number that's out there, but yet there's, there's a disconnect that we continuously see. Right. And so while there are women who are definitely leading the forefront in terms of advocacy work, lobbying, really getting things done. And, and I give credit to women because while the industry is being led by men, it's really a lot of women who are advocating for legalization. It's a lot of women who are doing the groundwork to make sure that these things are crossing over and that um, we're getting our just due. The issue lies in terms of business ownership. The issues lies in terms of women's senior leadership, right? Um, The issue lies in terms of retention. What is the industry doing that they're not able to retain senior women? What is the industry not doing for women and that they should be doing to invite more women on boards, right? Because it goes back to that point that I said earlier, how do you expect to have these results if you don't even have the voices at the table? I do believe in us having our own table, but when there are discussions that are happening about individuals or about groups of people and you don't have that group represented at the table, then how are you expecting to address the needs if you don't have their voice? And so when you think about what women are doing in this industry, we've said time and time again, we would be able to enter more or you would begin to see more of an influx if we had access to capital. So there's a lack of access to capital. We would be able to see more women sustain and survive in this industry if they had the proper support. Now, Women Girl is just one organization. Of course, there needs to be more, but there are more, by the way. I I have to acknowledge that there, there are other women's groups within this industry, but it still requires mentoring. It still requires that same foundational support. It still requires capital that's necessary. And, you know, women aren't feeling that, aren't seeing that in this industry for them. Uh, And if you look at mainstream and what mainstream is doing, they've recognized that. You look at what's happening in technology um, as well as other spaces. They're creating these funds that are for women-owned businesses. And, you know, While we're still in our infancy stage, I don't think we need to wait until we get into a more mature stage to say, oh, we should set up these funds for women. No, I think it needs to start now because what's growing into um, hopefully becoming stronger businesses will become those leaders. And we've seen some of those businesses happen, but we need more, right? Just a few aren't enough. Um, But I think women are doing incredible work. The ones that are here, they're doing incredible work in this industry. Uh, and, and, and I love how so many of them are lifting as they are climbing. And I think that's important. For us, it's the continued education and it's the continued access to not just information, but invitations to those networking circles where those deals and, and that deal flow is happening. Um, and then of course it's capital. I I can't wait for the day when we do have a safe banking um, act. Oh, I think you hit your mute button, Gia. There we go. What happened? 
happened? Did I? I don't know. Somehow your mute button came on. Can you hear me? I hear you now. I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. You, I lost. It was like right after when you were saying, "I can't wait until we have safe banking." Oh, I said I can't wait until we have safe banking because I think what you know, what we'll see, women will then be able to go to banks for loans, right? They don't have to wait to be invited to, you know, these private equity presentations to get into the rooms of meeting, you know, these venture capitalists or, or angel funders, you know, they'll, they'll have another source to go to. They won't have to go to family and friends to see if they'll be able to scrap together, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or, or up to a million, what have you to do what they need to do for their businesses. So I think that's, what's so important here is that having banking and for, and for safety, just for security and for safety, having banking in this space, um, especially for women owned businesses, I think is so critical. So, you know, I think women are, are on the path. Yes, we absolutely could use more resources and support, uh, but but I, I I feel hopeful, and I think as long as we continue to be intentional about our focus, um, the industry better watch out because they're going to see a rise. No, and I agree because for me personally, so like I'll say, the people that have been the most influential in my career have all been women, and I think that it's only right, um, you know, that they get to just do you know a recognition for everything they've done. But you said something so important that we need to see legislation. We shouldn't have to depend on these old boys clubs and networks to try to get ahead. But then also something you said that really that I thought was critical was that us having a seat at the table when it comes to policy and those things, because it's, it's, I think we're past the days of having people make up the policies and tell us what's good for us. Um, and that makes me think of New York. I mean, there's so much happening there in policy in New York up there on the East Coast. So we're in session now. And um, so I don't know if you know, but yesterday, gosh, what day? I don't even know what day it is. Is it Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? But L New Jersey is legal. Yes, so like, legal. right? So so not only did, you know, did the ballot referendum, you know, pass in terms of the green wave right back in November, but still Jersey was held up. But the governor, Governor Murphy, signed the bills. And so now New Jersey's off and running. So what does that mean? That means all eyes are now on New York. And so, you know, thankfully right now we're in our, um, we're in our legislative session and, um, you know, we're hoping that, you know, we'll be able to pass this bill. Uh, and we've been fighting for this bill for quite some time. On March 8th, actually, Women Grow is partnering with Jug Policy Alliance to have our second um, virtual women um, in cannabis lobby day. So we actually, we, we planned the first one. We planned for 200 plus women to go up to Albany, New York to, to lobby. And then the pandemic hit. And in 72 hours, we had to pivot to a virtual platform. And so um, that then, you know, led to us thinking, well, what are we going to do for 2021? Well, we're going to go back to a virtual platform. And so on March 8th, which is International Women's Day, uh, Women Grow and DPA, we're inviting, I mean, I'm, we're hoping to have 420 women join us or 420 women plus join us um, in, in lobbying, right, um, to have uh, our bill passed. Um, we have the governor's bill, which is CRTA. Many of us are um, in support of the MRTA. And so we've got a lineup of speakers. Uh, we have a number of videos of voices that represent our state. Um, it's more, more women, of course, but guess what? We've got our male allies that will be submitting um, and participating to show the support. Uh, and then we've got a number of, uh, of um, leadership um, that will be contributing to this conversation. And so, you know, if you are around to hear, I, I invite you to, you know, log in and, and, and join us and just listen in to a number of the women that will be speaking on March 8th for our lobby day. Um, because come April 1st, 
We are doing our best to get this bill signed and we are lobbying hard to get our legislators to hear our voices and to make sure that this bill is done right. Absolutely. You can count me in because, you know, being from New Jersey, we have to make sure it's right. Every, we can't just get New Jersey right and leave New York out, even though it's the first time we've ever beaten y'all to anything. I know. <laughs> I know. That's so, you know, it, it's crazy. But, you know, what, what I say about that is, I'm sorry, I'm battling a cold. So I'm sorry if I'm like running my nose. Um, but what's interesting about that is I think New Jersey is setting the tone. So while it may, you know, I, I love to keep using that line, be the first, but not the last, but they're setting the tone. And if we're looking at what happened in New Jersey, that means New York is looking, that means Connecticut is looking, that means Pennsylvania is looking. And you know, this whole corridor, right, is all talking about adult use at the same time. So I think we'll begin to see, you know, what's happening with one state and hope that we're able to you know, not only replicate, but even go a step further, right? And so, you know, that's why Lobby Day on March 8th is so important because we've seen what New Jersey's done. Now let's see what New York can do. And we are holding our legislators accountable to this. And um, hopefully they are listening. If not, we're going to damn sure make sure they are. <laughs> no, and all those powerful voices together, they better be listening. Um, and, and speaking of New York and the governor's bill, one thing that, that just came to my attention yesterday, um, I, I believe it's, is this something about in New York and the governor's bill about auctioning off the licenses, um, which seems like it would be, um, you know, when you talk about opportunity for most New Yorkers or people that have been impacted by the war on drugs, it would seem that that's something that would perpetuate a standard of the, the people that have the money to pay to play. Right. I think that that's something that we definitely need to have some awareness around. To hear, you know, what's interesting is that when we think about what's happened um, state over state and yeah, I said this to someone recently, I said, first of all, the fact that through legalization, we still have to remind people that minorities and women need to be written in is so insulting. Mm -hmm. It's as if we don't exist. But if we don't have that legislative written in, then if we don't have that legislation written in, then it's an, you know, then we're overlooked. Right. And so when you you bring up such a valid point that, you know, auctioning off, where does that leave us? Right. We already have difficulty getting access to capital. So now someone comes in with a big wallet. Then what? Um. No matter what, I'm still hopeful because I, I, you know, we saw that, especially that was part of the, um, I think the 30 day amendment um, right. that came out. And so, um, but what was a part of that, it wasn't a part of the first is that um, delivery, right? Um, delivery in terms of um, to consumer uh, wasn't a part of the governor's bill, but in part of his amendment, um, he added that um, there's going to be a lot of give and take here. Uh, but I'm hoping that we can do our best to make sure that um, folks that look like us are not um, are not being fed promises that will not be delivered. Mm -hmm. And um, if I were to circle back to the summit, one of the topics that we closed with and we intentionally closed with this topic was can, how can cannabis reinvest in our communities? Mm hmm. And we've talked about that so much because if we're constantly talking about this industry is being built on those very same backs and that our communities have been most harmed by the war on drugs and that even during COVID, our communities were most impacted by it. Why is it then that the very same thing that we're looking to legalize and make it fully legal and fully accessible to all, that some of those tax dollars are not going back into the communities that really have paid the price for it to happen in the first place. Right. Right. So true. And, you know, um, man. And so like when you, when you think about that and how to, how to impact those communities, I think, like you said, building off the momentum of New Jersey, it definitely is setting the standard. And we're seeing now 
like I said, again, it's great that you all are, you know, being politically active and leading that movement because in New Jersey, I saw where activists and advocates coming together, making their voices heard, were able to get those amendments and getting things changed. So definitely rooting for y'all in New York and um, hope, you know, this will make some major changes on the East Coast. Fingers crossed, prayers up. And, yep. you know, we just got to um, just keep fighting. Yeah. Now, now, Gia, you know, what, what type of advice do you have really for, you know, for women or people of color that are looking at the industry and saying that they want to get in, um, whether it's somebody that wants to be on the plant touching side or, you know, somebody that wants to transition their skills over like you did, you know, what type of advice do you have? Where should people really get started? Thank you for asking this question because I'm often, you know, hitting my DMs. People are sliding into the DMs, but <laughs> definitely not for personal reasons, but for the common question, how do I get in? And, and it's such a, a vast question to ask, right? But, you know, I don't judge those questions because I remember being that person. Um, but what I like to counter with is, what exactly do you think you want to do? What are you currently doing? And do you think that what you're currently doing could be applied here? And then as you enter with that experience, perhaps you can grow into another space. And the reason why I say that is, you know, it was at my first Women Grow meeting that I recognize, you know, I, I came with the notion of, oh, I'm going to cultivate, I, I'm going to own, you know, a dispensary. But to hear, I don't, I didn't own a single living plant. I don't know anything about growing. My plants, seriously, if you were to go come to my home, I had plastic plants until like the, the pandemic. Then I learned how to grow some. But, you know, I, I didn't know anything about growing. I'd never worked in a retail space. So someone's advice to me was do exactly what you're doing now. But in this industry was the best advice anyone could have ever given me, because that led to me not only applying my current skill sets, but also learning through my current skill sets on the areas that I thought were um, so intriguing and important to me, which is why I said, I, you know, don't see myself as an expert in this space. I see myself as a student always, because we're always learning. I'm learning from my clients. Um, I'm learning from people like you to hear. I'm learning from others in, in the industry. And so, you know, when people ask, where do I, where should I enter? I say, I ask, you know, are you a medical professional? Are you a nurse? Are you uh, even a school nurse of some sort, right? Or are you an accountant? Are you a virtual assistant? Like we need assistance, hello, right? And, and if you're able to bring those skills to the industry, that's one step in. And then once you get your foot into the door, continue to educate yourself, continue to learn and build relationships. Um, I'm always reading books. I'm always reading articles before my day starts. I'm reading about the news of the industry because it's so important to stay informed. Um, and so if people aren't doing their homework, then I'd honestly say you're not prepared to enter. Mm -hmm. Don't That's get in and that, you know, like, you should be preparing as you're reading everything because it's also helping you to craft your decision-making on which way you'd like to sway. Do you want to be on the ancillary side or do you want to be on the plant touching side by learning? And, and, and there, there are over 20 something um, higher education um, schools, universities, colleges that offer cannabis courses. Now they're online courses, they're magazines, they're books. I think that is so important for people um, to become informed, right? In learning and reading about the websites like NCIA that, you know, offers so much information. Um, so I think as people are looking to enter, I think it's just as important that they begin to read about it and keep just studying it like, like you're, you know, in your own online course. And then once you get in, apply those skill sets that you already have you don't have to stay there. You can grow into, you know, another um, field or start a business or, you know, do something else. So that's my advice. I agree, man. That is, and that is such amazing advice. If y'all are listening, I think that 
you know, like you said, it, it takes a little bit of work and planning. It's not just, you're not just going to get the answer from being in somebody's DMs on what you want to do. Like it takes some advice and planning and, and really figuring it out. And, you know, if you're doing it, not just for the money, because you read that cannabis is this new growing industry, but for the love and there's, there's really some times to enjoy and be had here in this industry. For sure. To hear we're part of the blueprint. Yep of the, the building of this industry. Anyone who is starting now, I don't care if you're starting today or you started five years ago, we're still in the infancy stage of this. It's still an emerging market. So anyone that is entering, you're part of building this, which is why, you know, asking in a DM, like, how do I get in? I'm like, I can't answer you <laughs> in one response. Are you kidding me? Like that's, it's too big. But um, the beauty of it is that there are people who are coming um, who, who don't have any cannabis experience, but have tons of experience in other industries. And that's amazing because we need that experience to help build this one. Right. And I'm also going to offer that Women Grow is one of those amazing resources that you should look at if you're trying to figure out how to get into the industry. Um, you know, like so many, like she said, so many great, amazing women leaders there. But I'm also going to say, even if you're not a woman, it's an organization that you should support. Um, and there's something that can be learned there by anybody, male or female. Um, so... That's so true. Do you know how many men say, can I come to your meeting? I'm like, we're not she man haters, right? So you absolutely can, you know, the, the women grow, of course, is targeted to women, but it's not exclusive. We, when pre pandemic, we had more men coming to our signature networking events because they said, we actually found more serious business people at your events. We found more um, critical information at your events. And so there were men who said, I found my business partner here, or I found the service provider that I wanted. I've made so many hires coming to your events. And that's exactly why we created, um, you know, I, I think that the founders had that sort of foresight, right? In which we continue to honor, um, although we're honoring it now online, but um, you know, it's so important that we did that. We had a, a partnership with m for mm recently on uh, the boot camp of um, and, and how to enter into the hemp industry. And it was one of our best boot camps. I tell you to hear people were online for nine hours and di we didn't lose a single person. Wow. The amount of content that we had, and it was an even split of women and men who participated. And they're still coming back saying, when's the next one? They stayed on a Saturday from nine in the morning until what, six or so six hours, uh, nine hours later. We couldn't believe it. We were like, this is incredible. So it's, you know, people like yourself that come to the meetings that we love to see. Yeah. And speaking of that, tell everybody where, where they can find out, you know, what's, what's coming up next from Women Grow and GVM and where can people find out more information and, you know, social media and everywhere else. Sure. Thank you so much. So, you know, we definitely invite everyone to follow us across all platforms, which is at Women Grow. Um, you can follow me. I'm on social media as well. Um, at Gia underscore VM. So V as in victory, M as in many more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, GVM Communications, um, I invite you to find us at gvmcomsinc.com. Uh, you know, we've got incredible work um, that's happening. I mean, uh, on the Women Grow Front, I say uh, we've got the Lobby Day coming up. Uh, we have this incredible partnership um, that we are launching with Cura Leaf. Um, so we're so happy to work with them. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Greenflower Media, um, ArcView. You know, we see this as the, the um, years of partnerships, right? Intentional partnerships, working with people. Um, again, it's back to that lifting as you climb. And uh, creating these resources um, for women. I'm excited um, that we'll soon be announcing our mentorship program. I'm, I cannot wait until we're able to like fully share that with the public. Um, we will be having a virtual um, leadership summit this year. Uh, we're still, you know, being 
very cautious and, and, and staying within safety measures. So we'll go back to live events in 2022. Um, and then for GVM communications, I'm excited. Our team has, is doing incredible work and we've got, um, an awesome, awesome new client that we're uh, looking forward to sharing um, more information about. They're a cannabis tech company. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I, I think you know, Dr. Olodari um, Odomoso, yes. and he's our client, Zalera Therapeutics. They're doing incredible work, Alera Holistic. We've got just kick-ass clients that we love and enjoy working with. We've worked with Wanda, uh, Wanda James, um, you know, it, it's, it's awesome. And, and, you know, anyone that's interested in PR work, certainly, you know, um, hit us up. And I thank you so much to hear for this opportunity. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to have you. And I'm definitely looking forward to catching up. Um, yeah. And, and for everybody out there listening, um, another big thank you to our sponsors, to Copper State Wellness, um, Tahoe Wellness, um, Law Officer Omar Figueroa for sponsoring the DEI work here at NCIA. And thanks, everybody, for listening for another week of the Cannabis Diversity Report. Gia, so thankful to have you. Make sure y'all check out Women Grow and GVM Communications. And I'll see y'all soon. Peace. Thank you.